Good morning, everyone. For join Thank you for joining us for the STED Talk, the Science, Technology, Education, and Discovery uh, for Spine Surgery. Today we'll have Dr. Fernando Villamil. Uh, he's an orthopedic spine surgeon at Spine in Jenks, Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Villamil is an orthopedic surgeon for 15 years. He completed his fellowship at Mass General and at the Harvard Combined Spine Fellowship. Uh, here we have Dr. Chapman, uh, but um, we will move forward with our case presentations and then later we'll go back to uh, introducing Dr. Villamil. So our first case for this morning We have a 37 year old male that had a seizure and is now complaining of low back pain. They've persisted, uh, or the pain has been persistent for around seven days, no weakness, no numbness or tingling, but inability to ambulate for the past few days now due to pain, no bowel or bladder symptoms. Here you can see the exam is uh, normal. Here you can see imaging was obtained in the ER upon presentation. You can see an L1 burst fracture, AO3, A3 type. 30 to 40% canal stenosis from retropulsion. They have intact facets, but there is a sagittal laminar split fracture. And there is about local uh, 30 degrees of local kyphosis about that level. An MRI was obtained and you can see uh, there is local kyphosis and then there's the inner spinous process edema on T2 stir imaging, but no overtly torn posterior ligamentous complex. So an upright X-ray and a TLSO was obtained that now shows around 35 degrees kyphosis. And the patient was uh, very immobile, very limited, and uh, the pain was intolerable. So at this point, the question becomes, what would you do now? Zian Chapman, sorry, I came a little bit late. Um, uh, I think great presentation. I'm very glad you used the AO system. Uh, I assume the posterior ligament this complex was intact. Correct. Uh, it was quote intact, but it's one of those processes where there's edema, but no overtly torn ligament. You can see the supraspinous is in continuity. Um, I believe that the ligament flavum was also intact, but there was just edema. Yeah. This is one of those, uh, questionable cases. So it stays as an A, otherwise it would be a B type injury or a B2 injury. And that would be a very clear surgical indication. And Again, the weird thing in this patient, if I got your presentation right, is he's okay laying down. He's a healthy, uh, uh, psychosocially uh, well-balanced person. And uh, even with a TLSO, which is well-fitting in a non-obese patient, he starts hurting a lot. Yep. Yeah. So our visiting professor today, uh, are you live? Are you with us? Dr. Villamil, Fernando? Okay, don't have them yet. Um, so from my end, I think this is a very clear surgical indication uh, with um, traditionally, a lot of people would say two above, two below, but this is our young man. He has a whole life ahead of him. I think he had a baby or a newborn around. Uh, where you came from in Ohio, would you guys have fixed this fracture or would you have kind of toughed it out? Uh, is there anybody who still uses a hyperextension cast? Yeah, I think that it would have been attempted like this. Um, and then depending on the patient's immobility, this patient apparently had some pretty severe pain even while uh, trying to turn in bed. So I think that was a pretty clear in yeah. indication for uh, operative. And I think you're right, two up, two down, maybe what would have been done uh, in Akron, but it also depends on um, how active the patient was trying to spare levels. Yeah, so this is obviously the big thing. And what was the bad thing about doing short segment fixation, one above, one below? What was so bad about that? Uh, I believe that there was just higher, higher failure rates. And I think that they even talked about doing load clear load bearing classifications uh, to try to see if anterior column support was needed. Yeah. So let's just fast forward to what we did and maybe you can uh, editorialize. Yep. And so you can see here, uh, the decision was made to go posterior first. Uh, you can see on the far left image there that there's a uh, down pushing tamp to kind of push that uh, retro pulse fragment um, from around uh, from the back. And then after, uh, uh, fixation was obtained, uh, the, the decision was to go anteriorly for a uh, partial corpectomy. And you can see here that there is a short segment fixation in that fractured level to increase the biomechanical strength that was placed purposely on the right. So that a left-sided lateral approach could be obtained here. You can see that. 
with the corpectomy cage. Great. And then you can see here, follow up imaging. And this is done through a far lateral uh, approach? Correct. Yeah. So uh, the patient did how? Remain neurologically intact, pain-free, and no disability at one year final follow-up. Yeah. Uh, when you go to, this is the L1 level, I take it? L1, yes, L1. correct. Uh, was there any violation of the pleural space? How did the diaphragm get managed? Uh, I think at the time it was listed as a retro uh, pleural, but I think that there was an area where the diaphragm had to be uh, removed from its distal attachments to get at L1. Um, L1 is obviously a weird uh, area that may be either above or below the diaphragm or in the middle of the diaphragm's attachment. So you may en encounter both spaces, both retropleural and retroperitoneal. Great. So what are your thoughts now? Does this kind of, a, this is obviously just one case, but this kind of approach philosophy change your approach towards burst fractures? Um, I, I just did a lateral course uh, uh, over the past weekend, and it does seem like a great technology, especially for indications like this. Um, <clears throat> I'm still torn on whether or not um, posterior is 100 per, or I mean, the lateral corpectomy is 100% needed if it's uh, well fixed like this from posterior. Um, I don't see the harm in maybe waiting and getting upright x-rays over time and then deciding if I need to do the, the anterior part of the procedure. But I mean, this looks, this looks good. Yeah. I mean, this makes it obviously bulletproof. Uh, whereas without a anterior column support, even good bone, there would probably be a high likelihood of the sagging a bit, at least, uh, by my understanding of the literature and with our AO spine knowledge forum, uh, the wide acceptance is that without anterior column support, you lose about five plus degrees, uh, not the end of the world, but uh, there's clearly a sag with posterior fixation. Uh, so, uh, and that's despite bracing, this patient could be mobilized without a brace. Uh, that said, it's another surgery, it's another potential for trauma and complications. But I thought this is, and for me personally, this has changed how I approach uh, burst fractures. I fix them from the back first, short segment, if at all possible, based on bone quality and see what I get, get a CT, see how the patient looks. And if I'm still worried about the comminution of the ventral vitreal body being substantial, then have a expert in far lateral surgery like Dr. Esquian do that second surgery. Yep. Who shall we have as next speaker? Okay, Zach, great job. Thank you, Jerry, and thanks for uh, getting us going. And introduce yourself, please. Uh, hey, I'm Zach. I'm a neurosurgery spine fellow from Canada here at uh, Swedish. Um, today, I'm presenting a patient we did two months ago. This is a 43-year-old, pretty robust male uh, with disabling back pain that radiates into his anterior thighs. He's neurologically intact on exam, save for hip flexor limitations due to back pain. Um, so the medical history, this patient has a history of a giant cell carcinoma that was diagnosed in 2015. Um, this is a rare, aggressive, non-cancerous tumor, often growing near the joints or at the ends of bones, often in long bones in the legs and arms. Most often when people are kind of completing their growth curve, uh, adults between the ages of 20 and 40, when skeletal bone growth is done. Um, these are scans from 2015, T2 sagittal on the left, T1 pre-contrast middle, T1 post-contrast on the right. Um, this was managed at an outside institution. Um, first step in December 2015 was a left-sided shark bite approach for an anterior excision of his previously visualized giant cell tumor at L4 and L5 with a standalone lateral cage placement uh, at L3 to 5. This uh, predictably failed and it was a subtotal excision and his construct started to collapse. So this was treated with a contralateral right-sided shark bite approach for further resection of the tumor. Um, again, there was just a lateral cage placed. Um, there was no interbody placement, no graft. Um, he presented to us in 2022. So seven years after his initial uh, duo of surgeries, um, he's currently a construction worker. He can work about two days a month because he has to take two weeks off after each shift because he's in so much pain. 
but he has two daughters um, and has to support his family somehow. He's currently resorting to daily injections of street fentanyl due to his pain. Um, he's had 44 radiation treatments and has been deemed cured of his germ cell tumor. So um, he was so, in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do. So um, as you look back on this case, which is again treated in an outside hospital, mm -hmm. Uh, without being judgmental, just what did you learn? Or what would you uh, kind of envision if you're presented with this case a priori in your oral boards and neurosurgery? What would the desired uh, treatment approach be? Um, I think this patient needed... go back a little bit? Oh, yeah. Um, I think he needed more than a standalone laterally placed cage, especially when you're taking out the majority of two vertebral bodies from the front. I don't Can think go this... back one more? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I don't think this construct really had a chance of, uh, of working. Um, so what's the basic principle um, for giant cell tumor management in the spinal column? I think uh, if, uh, you can get away with a subtotal resection because it's relatively radiosensitive. This guy had 44 treatments of radiotherapy. Um, but I think there needs to be uh, a discussion about a more robust fusion construct prior to surgery as part of the plan. I don't think you could just do this from a standalone lateral approach. I think you'd need at the very minimum, a more robust anterior construct fusion. And to be honest, uh, you definitely needed posterior supplementation with instrumentation, um, extending above and below the level of the tumor. So what is the non-surgical management of giant cell tumor these days? If you see somebody like that and you have a biopsy proven giant cell tumor, what's the radiation chemotherapy? What medic nah, uh, chemotherapy? Uh, I want to be more specific. There's actually a medicational treatment, a monoclonal antibody treatment. I'm, I'm not sure. It's called denosumab. This is that RANKL, oh. R-A-N-K-L yep. um, uh, ligand. So mm -hmm. Uh, that's actually widely considered to be uh, following proper staging, which is not done here. There's no CT, there's no, no. bone scan, um, uh, but that's widely considered in a logically intact patient, a very reasonable first approach. Radiation, these are actually not very radiation sensitive. They're kind of in between. So you have to probably look for a generation three uh, radio surgery, kind of an approach to try to get more energy load in there. But uh, Antibody, monoclonal antibody treatment with hmm. the neosumab is a very reasonable first step nowadays. So yeah. not chemotherapy. Um, yeah, and that would probably explain his 44 radiation treatments. Yeah. Um, so um, so the second problem is the location here. This is a high biomechanics load mm -hmm. area. Uh, it's an anatomically very problematic location right behind the bifurcation. Yeah. So access is a problem. Biomechanical loading is a problem. So in a hypothetical parallel universe, uh, how would you approach this then surgically? Let's say the patient got denosumab, you followed him for a year, he has intractable back pain, you can't brace him properly. Uh, what would the surgical sequence be, just very briefly, in an yeah. ideal world? I think, uh, I think it's reasonable um, to approach this anterolaterally, like, like they had considered, but I don't think that you could do this solely from that approach. I think you would need... Um, anterolaterally just so you have more access to take out as much as possible. But I think, I think it'd be hard to do it all from the back is what I'm saying. Um, so, yeah. So let me interrupt you. So we should probably show this case when we have our spine tumor course with, uh, all of our mavens there, the most common approach probably would be posterior first, uh, one or two levels above fixation mm -hmm. and resect as much of the tumor from the back as possible, realizing that we're interlesional. The goal of surgery being, again, the traditional goal of surgery being the largest possible excisional uh, management uh, to the point of um, a uh, almost in toto resection. So basically creating a clear barrier between uh, dural sac and that retropulsed uh, tumor tissue uh, through the pedicles on both sides sealing the pedicle stubs with um, uh, probably cement even, resecting the transverse processes, and again, getting the largest possible core out of this vertebral body, uh, creating a barrier and then coming in from the front and uh, lifting this off. There are surgeons who would do an in toto resection from the back. Uh, I have done those for giant cell tumors, but at higher levels, I'd be very worried about trying to do a uh, corpectomy from the back, an attempt at an in 
in total corpectomy from mm -hmm. the back, given the bifurcation, given how much this tumor has expanded into the retroperitoneum rod. Uh, uh, corpectomy, uh, giant cell tumor, uh, back, front, front, back. What are your thoughts? The instinctive thing is always to go from the front, but I think from the back first, creating margins and then doing a selective front resection uh, is a better deal. Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of these together. I think going in from the back, um, stabilizing it, taking as much out of the poster wall, and then um, you know, getting uh, a good decompression and then staging it and coming back in from the front, I think is worked beautifully on these cases. And again, for something like this, because it's a slow growing tumor, neither radiation or chemo really work. And so it's kind of like ABC, tumors and other you know pathology unless you get a really good resection and you got to get this thing to fuse i think you're gonna have to especially a young person gonna have to follow this for a long time if you don't if you don't get a good resection so good principles of staging proper biopsy with a marked biopsy track um obviously risk benefit assessment i don't have a ct here but uh, i strongly assume that there's just a cavity there mm -hmm. so it'll be a mechanical issue also just a pain thing but i would in a neurologic intact patient has a reasonably weight-bearing spinal column probably try i obviously have an oncology team work with me i'd probably try a monoclonal antibody and watch that lesion see how the patient does they usually decrease their amount of swelling and again, depends upon the amount of bone collapse. And only in case of a failure um, would I then consider surgery. And I would do the surgery posterior anterior. Now let's go to the present date. So now we have a real mess. Uh, we have a massively radiated area and a catastrophic collapse. Uh, Rod, what are your thoughts? I mean, you saw this patient mm -hmm. first. This is obviously a desperate situation, a young man. Was there any sign of disease recurrence? Um, you know, it's very hard to tell because of the um, deformity and the pseudoarthrosis, whether uh, there was recurrence. And, um, you know, we tried to be as aggressive as we could, given, you know, the circumstances that were ahead of us. So how do we proceed, Zach? Um, we proceeded uh, in a three-step manner. Um, so day one... Uh, approach from the front, did an anterior approach, vascular surgery, mobilized the great vessels with great care, and we removed that uh, laterally collapsed placed plate uh, from L3 to 5 and completed an L4 corpectomy, took out residual grumus, which was suspicious, suspicious for tumor, um, proceeded in the same day um, to flip him over uh, prone, uh, performed a T11 to pelvis, posterior instrumented fusion, quad rod constructs, L3 to S1 lamines with removal of residual grumus slash tumor. Um, did three column osteotomies from L3 to L5. These are intraoperative images or immediately post-op scalp films from a CAT scan. Um, then proceeded next day to go OR3 from the front. Uh, performed the completion of a partial corpectomy, uh, lower 50% of L3, upper 30% of L5, um, ALF L3 to 5 with that structure, that uh, shaved uh, custom fit, a L3 to 5 structural allograft with an allograft core. Um, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And uh, then postoperatively, patient did really well. Um, Discharged home post up day 10, no complications. Rod, how's he been doing? Um, you know, he he did well. Uh, the main issue with him is that he, um, the narcotics uh, pain management, you know, getting a guy like this off narcotics is going to be a long term struggle. But he, I mean, he's walking, his radiculopathy is gone. He's super, super happy. Nice. Yeah. In a patient with a neoplastic lesion like this, would you ever use bone morphogenic protein in the off-label fashion? I mean, and because he's young, I, I don't I don't think we have to resort to it, but um, you know, it's off-label because it's non-cancerous. I think you could potentially put it posteriorly. Yeah. I probably wouldn't put it in anterior. Yeah, we didn't we didn't put it in at yeah. all. I think, yeah, we were just too worried that this yeah. would uh, cause an escalation. This is such a bizarre disease process uh, that it's a paraneoplastic lesion. Uh, so uh, 
we just don't know what's going on with that uh, in terms of interacting with BMP. Um, thoughts from your end, from a Canadian perspective? We keep, we're raised in a different healthcare system. Um, no, I mean, I like to think that we would have performed the latter sequence of operations than the former, um, but I'm happy with how we did. I was involved with all three cases and um, it worked out really well for him. So I think if you want to go anteriorly first, which is the instinctive thing, yeah, have a large lateral uh, uh, lesion. I think there's no problem with doing a three-stage surgery. So yeah. you want to resect it first uh, as much as possible, create a sealant towards whatever pedicle residuals there are, mm. and then come in from posterior, stabilize it, realign it, and then fill in the gaps, so to say. Yeah. That's a very reasonable alternative approach. But uh, most of us overestimate how much we can actually resect from the front or and, the back even you uh, know or the back but again from the back you can basically get to the far side of your corpectomy far yeah. better and isolate that area so you can actually then safely mobilize and excise that that's the one advantage of going back first and then from the front i think i'm swayed by my anecdotal history of like a case series of three in my my uh experience of treating this type of tumor. And I just remember in one case, um, someone tried to treat it all from the back and this isn't typically a bloody tumor, but in this case it was extremely bloody. And we tried to do as much as we could from the back, which was literally taking two rat bites with a pituitary, seeing how bloody it was and then scurrying away in fear because of, yeah. Yeah. So uh, they are actually usually bloody. I'm not sure what your other experiences are. Okay. Some tumors are actually bloody. Um, so and embolization can be considered, but at L4 it's probably meaningless. And the true. thoracic spine, I'd embolize them first. Mm -hmm. All right, good case. Thank you. And who's Thanks. next? Dr. Jared Cook. Sorry. Cool. Okay. And who else? Nathan? I'm up after. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello. So introduce yourself, please. All right. Um, I'm Jared Cook. I'm uh, one of the orthopedic spine fellows. Um, so I have this case, the 40-year-old uh, male uh, with Down syndrome uh, presents with uh, low back pain. Uh, he's nonverbal, uh, has developmental delay. And um, he, nine months prior, had fallen from a six foot high structure, like a retaining wall, um, and it has been becoming progressively less functional, less uh, ambulatory. He used to be independent. Now he uh, he's coming in, ambulating in a wheelchair. He doesn't have any neuro deficits. So he is uh, quite pitched forward. Um, he had x-rays at an outside facility and was uh, you know uh, diagnosed on a um, imaging. Uh, to have a possible pathologic fracture of L4, get a biopsy, um, no neoplasm or infection. Uh, so when it comes to us, it's difficult to follow commands, but at least moving everything uh, full range of motion against gravity. And so here's what we see on, um, on the films that he came in with, a, a significant um, wedge deformity of L4, and you can see him kyphosing at that point, also has coronal plane deformity, and then see this uh, starting bridging callus, which you can see better on the CT as he's uh, trying to heal this at this point, um, but significant uh, osseous defect, uh, as well as that bridging. Uh, it's kind of holding him in that place. So here's what we see right at uh, right above at uh, the L3-4 disc space. And here is a slice uh, through the uh, L4 body. So um, not a uh, not a significant um, amount of, uh, um, of stenosis, but not insignificant either. Um, but essentially, we're looking at the, the deformity and the bone quality. So at this point, you know, what do we do? So we uh, plan to do a two-stage procedure, start in the back with a L2 to pelvis fusion with a quadrod construct and, uh, and decompression, and then follow that up with a uh, lateral L4 corpectomy. And so here's what we see from our uh, posterior construct. And so good coronal plane uh, correction, good sagittal plane correction. Um, and then uh, you know, we got the um, L4 uh, corpectomy, and so this is what the final construct looked like on the uh, on the scouts. And then here's 
uh, here's our CT. So at this point, he's, uh, he's well decompressed. He's well aligned. Everything's looking good. Um, doing great after surgery, good with physical therapy, uh, starting to ambulate. He's getting around with a walker and comes in uh, for a post-operative appointment. So clinically doing very well, not much pain with, uh, with sitting. His neuro exam is, uh, you know, the same uh, as it's not particularly testable, but still moving everything very well. And his mother is noticing that he's starting to pitch forward again. So here are the, uh, the new films at that point. So you can see on the CT, he still has this correction, but once you have him uh, upright, um, he starts to uh, kyphose uh, proximally. But clinically still uh, still doing well, and they've elected to uh, uh, observe at this point. So why don't you go back to the initial things, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Skuyan to help us understand. So what's, uh, I'll actually start with you, Jared. What happened there initially? Was this an, a missed injury? Did he have some tumor? What do you think went on in retrospect? Um, well, I think from the, from the story, you know, this is, uh, this is a, a nonverbal patient, uh, who had a fall, um, you know, likely, you know, suffered this fracture during that fall and, um, you know, wasn't really able to, uh, to communicate it. Uh, there was, um, also, uh, kind of an, an issue with, uh, uh, I guess other people being able to observe him at, uh, at the facility, um, where he was, where he was doing, um, you know, physical therapy. Uh, it, it just seemed like, uh, there was some like lack of, uh, noticing his postural changes and his discomfort until it kind of got to a point where he actually seemed to demonstrate, uh, like outward obvious signs of pain. Um, so I, I think it was, uh, I think it was partially due to his inability to tell people, um, you know, that it was, uh, that I was having a problem. So uh, we probably think this is a missed injury and mm -hmm. he just as a nonverbal patient couldn't handle this. Um, Rod, dealing with nonverbal patients is a huge mm -hmm. ethical challenge. Um, this patient clearly was very disabled. He was severely hunched forward. Mm -hmm. He could respond with yes and no's. It's a very likable person. He smiles and all that, but he can't really enunciate. How can we kind of understand them better? How can we uh, see what, uh, what they need and what uh, we should do in an ethically sensible, but also medically feasible and safe fashion? I think that's an excellent question. Um, and in this case, uh, we were very fortunate because we had a mother who um, was extremely uh, knowledgeable and- And very attentive. Yeah, uh, very good communicator and good advocate for her son. Yeah. And we spent hours with her. Um, and again, I mean, this was a very unstable situation in terms of his fracture and, um, and a kid who's young and very active. And I think because of the cognitive stuff that he had going on, um, you know, it's hard to manage this with non-operatively. And, and I think he had a real def deformity and a lot of uh, significant amount of pain. Yeah. And for me, this was uh, obviously challenging and interesting at the same time in many ways but this showed what happens with a burst fracture if you don't treat it basically and again historically we always thought that lower lumbar burst fractures heal fine because there's a larger spinal canal and they kind of just settle and we can compensate for loss of lower doses a bit more but um, again whatever the circumstances of this patient's were they obviously brought up the worst of a burst fracture he really tilted forwards and backwards. Do you mind going back to the CT and the MRI? Yeah. And so basically the vertebral body over time simply dissolved and the patient went into substantial deformity. And um, from what we could observe, uh, he expressed himself with grunting. He uh, significantly grunted whenever he was up and around and moved around. So that was uh, a very reproducible thing. He was reasonably comfortable when he lay down after an initial would look like a pain response. And then when he get up, he'd really start grunting very heavily and could not hold himself up. He basically stood with his hands and his knees. But it's obviously very, very difficult to explore this. Now, bone density wise, what do you see there? Is this a good bone density or? Um, it's a, uh, it was pretty borderline, um, you know, not a, I mean, he's, uh, it, you know, he was active and, you know, 40 years old. Um, so I, he did have good bone density for, um, 
you know, for that, um, if that's what you're, if that's yeah, what you're I'm, asking. Uh, basically, obviously, we want to understand the bone density prior to yeah. any deformities. Hey, here's a so, little osteopenic, but yeah, uh, I thought yeah, that's his R or I circle, so the Hounsfield units that we determined with CT scans were kind of in the 100 to 10 region at L1, so not horrible, but not great either. Yeah, but not a preclusion towards possible surgery. Um, in terms of deformity uh, correction, uh, you obviously know the case, so I'm going to ask Dr. Squin, what are your usual thoughts? What, is this something where you just go anteriorly, jack them open, or what are your thoughts in terms of getting this straight again, and how long should we go? I mean, the problem, I think, on this case is that <clears throat> if you go to the post-op images, is that, you know, I think standing films on somebody like this and bone quality and and you know, getting, you know, how much correction you get, how much role does the hip and pelvis play in something like this. And I think just based on what I've seen, I think we probably undercorrected him um, because he, I remember even post-op, he, you know, he's very hunched forward, even when he was sitting at the side of the bed. Yeah. And I don't think he was wearing his brace. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's tough because we didn't want to cross the thoracolumbar junction, but I think, unfortunately, he sort of, you know, kyphosed again and starting to get a little PJK above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was uh, impressed. Do you have any other interoperative images? We really, so we went posteriorly first, uh, resected that lesion as good as possible, uh, had good fixation on the top and on the bottom. But this was a major struggle to get this uh, released and get this lordotic. This was not, you can see all these distractors in there. And uh, this was after hours of kind of peeling out whatever bone ligament contact we could find there. This was not straightforward. Um, were you there for that case? Uh, I was there for the lateral part. The lateral part, yeah. Assume that in the posterior part, uh, this was hours of work. Uh, which surprised me. I thought this would be like an hour, maybe corpectomy and intravertebral or intervertebral distractors. But, uh, but getting getting this yeah, over here, I was... thought I thought this would be just a simple walk in the park. But it was literally socked down, and a rather precarious dissection. So that technically was difficult, and we got him to I think neutral. Um, uh, overall, it looked like a nice lordosis. So I think. I, I was as pleased as I could be with what we had achieved there. Uh, but again, you can see the retail body itself uh, remained collapsed. We, we got probably a neutral inferior end plate of uh, L2, super end plate of uh, L4, but not totally sure. Actually, that's L5. So uh, <clears throat> L3 to 5, we got neutral. But you're right. I mean, in an ideal world, we probably hyperlordosed him more. But I thought we had that at the top. Should we have gone right away into the lower thoracic spine rod? I mean, I think we did the right thing. You know, you can always go back and say we should have fused more, but I mean, I felt very good about the construct and what we we done. I mean, um, it's tough. You know, I don't think in a young um, patient like this who's very active, I wouldn't just right off the bat go to T10. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, we had obviously molded yeah. over. We were actually pleased with the fixation quality. He had actually reasonably good bone, and we put large, mm -hmm. long screws in. We did not, we had cement on standby. We were possibly going to even band it, but we felt good about it. And he's, in principle, a very compliant patient. Uh, so when mom tells me to do something, he's a good boy. He does it. Yeah. Um, so he, he had a hard time wearing the brace in the beginning, but uh, later on, he, he got it, but he very rapidly assumed a forward curved position again. So uh, fast forward is now. So obviously, initially had a pretty hard time getting over the surgery. Um, he was with us for like two to three weeks mm -hmm. without any complications. It was just very hard to verbalize with him. And our nurses did a hard, a very good job for you as you went in on the corpectomy um, did anything stick in your mind? You came in from the left side where he had the large heterotopic bone. Was yeah. that very hard to get through there to get the safe? Yeah, I mean, uh, just access? like you, surprisingly, it was extremely stuck and very difficult to get all the bone fragments out and to get that uh, cage in there. Now, this cage looks like it's kyphotic. Did you try to put a lordotic cage in? Or we tell did, us a little bit about yeah. the cage morphology that you chose. Yeah, so this is a um, 
Medtronic Stratosphere cage, um, and it kind of has a um, the end plates kind of are able to um, maneuver and rotate in three dimension, and so we we really tried to get this to open up, and we just that's the max that it could go, and I didn't want to get you know because you can see especially on a on the sagittal view you got to be careful because you can really get um <clears throat> get some significant subsidence and in plate fractures so it's kind of a balance all right and so initially had done well from this and this is done through a far lateral approach this is yeah kind of open this is a lateral yeah. approach okay so. and you had a very large or long uh in terms of the a to p plane a very long cage Profile there, very long cage and very long retractor. Yeah, and um, very close to iliac crest. You can see that there. It was not an easy lateral right. approach. All right, but no complications on that. Did you? Have no, I mean he did yeah. great. You saw afterwards. Yeah, he, no femoral nerve. When do you have all this heterotopic bone? Can you still use uh, neurostimulators or anything like that for monitoring purposes? What do you do in that setting? Well, we mapped the plexus before we put a retractor down, and I, if I, I like to actually, I think in this case I found the plexus. I don't know. I can't remember who did it with me, mm -hmm. and I placed the retractor yeah. um, in front of it. So great. Okay, any insights from yourself? So how has he done in the interim now on the uh, longer run? Uh, so, you know, clinically he's, you know, he's doing well uh, as, you know, as objectively, uh, you know, the, the posture is of course going to, you know, going to bother us, but he's, you know, um, he's ambulatory, which is, uh, which is a big thing and not complaining of uh, pain the way he was before. So, um, you know, kind of have to take the win, even though it makes us uncomfortable from a radiographic standpoint. Um, that's kind of where we are right now. Good. Yeah. So he's, uh, I think almost a year out now, right? Um, probably, about, probably about six months, six months. Yeah. And so he we'll developed vasoplegia post-op in the ICU. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, what's vasoplegia, Jared? Um, let me see if I can recall this correctly. Um, uh, so it's, uh, loss of, uh, sympathetic tone. Um, and so you, uh, you end up, uh, hypotensive. That's, uh, not particularly responsive. Um, uh, I think I'm it's an that. endovascular persistent hypotension yeah. uh, without having preload um, or uh, internal organ failure. It's mm -hmm. presumed to be an unresponsiveness of um, a variety of receptors uh, mm -hmm. towards uh, standard impulses of uh, uh, blood pressure and uh, hemodynamic control. Right. And it's usually defined as needing two or three different categories of adrenergic substances to try to maintain blood pressure. Right. So it's not load, preload, or organ failure. It's uh, a endovascular receptor uh, disorder. And we think it's uh, probably due to uh, medication side effects. Mm -hmm. It may have to do with an imbalance from overuse of opiates. Uh, we actually just have a paper accepted uh, for publication with uh, Dr. Ishak, a former fellow um, here. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And we have one more case before our visiting professor comes on. We have uh, 15 minutes. Oh, all right. Well, it's still quick. Good. It doesn't change. So we have on April 30th, and we have Dr. Glenn David here. Uh, let's get you a microphone, Glenn. Do you mind coming over? No, these don't work. Yeah, you have to use this one, the big microphone. So, Dr. David, we have the April 30th first annual guided interventional. Now, you've had multiple spine courses before. How is this one different? Yeah, this is going to be uh, uh, specializing in more advanced techniques in interventional spine, uh, alongside with uh, co chairs of uh, Dr. Uh, Beal and Dr. Naidu. Uh, we'll be going over, uh, as well as uh, other guest lecturers, going over uh, some advanced techniques. Uh, uh, our previous courses uh, here at, uh, at Seattle Science Foundation has included uh, more fellows courses, and this is more uh, more advanced uh, imaging and advanced techniques for interventional spine. So, what does that mean? Talking about stimulators? Uh, for example, uh, uh, some more advanced techniques in uh, fragile augmentation, uh, uh, highlighting uh, some of the more advanced uh, uh, techniques for uh, spinal cord stimulation. 
uh, rather than the basics uh, and uh, going over some of the latest techniques for SI joint fusion. Uh, they'll be going over some of the interdiscal biologics they'll be going over as well, uh, just to name a few things. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it. Okay. Dr. Pratt. Yes, sir. Nathan Pratt, Spine Fellow here at Swedish. Uh, I will show you a little different case um, where a lateral approach was used to augment uh, posterior uh, uh, deformity surgery. So we have a 64 year old woman with a very complicated surgical history. She has progressive kyphosis after multiple spinal fusions, beginning with a motor vehicle collision in 1996. She had some sort of a fusion done at that point. Then she had a four to one A lift in 2006. Then she had a T10 to pelvis after that failed in 2015. Then she had a revision T4 to pelvis after that failed in 2016. Then she had removal of the pelvic screws and some of her other hardware in 2021 because she had some skin breakdown. Now she's got debilitating back and leg pain. She's leaning off to her left side. She's having multiple falls, gait imbalance, requires a walker to even ambulate, and it's not able to go very far in terms of distance. It's just not able to go very far. She's very miserable at this point. She Medical history is not super uh, revealing depressions and panic attacks, narcotic dependence, as, as you'd kind of expect from someone with this kind of chronic pain. Uh, physical exam-wise, she has a little bit of proximal muscle weakness in her lower extremities, but is otherwise... Uh, you know, relatively unrevealing neurologically. She has a BMI that's sort of in the normal range on the low, on the lower end at 19.65. She looks smaller than that. She's very thin. You can palpate the hardware, uh, particularly in the thoracic spine. Um, you, you can feel some of the screw heads. Uh, she stands leaning noticeably, I'm sorry, to the right side um, and requires, not a cane, she requires a four-wheel walker uh, for stabilization during walking. So here's her standing scoliosis x-ray. This is after her T4 to pelvic uh, revision uh, at, at the other facility and obviously has a uh, back lift and pump as well. Another bad sign. Uh, high pelvic incidence is 75 degrees. Lumbar lordosis is very low at uh, 31.4. It's actually even hard to measure because of how rotated or how, how lean off she is. Um, significant mismatch, 45 degrees. Her SVA is positive 14 centimeters. Uh, she is retroverting, even with that SVA, she's retroverting her pelvis to get her even to positive greater than 10. So she's, she's uh, compensating as much as possible and still not able to stand upright. Uh, and then coronally, she's over 10 centimeters over uh, to the right side, as you can pretty clearly see just looking visually at that image. Um, I include here her CT Milo just to show you that she has a solid arthrodesis throughout her uh, lumbar spine. Uh, she's also solidly fused in her thoracic spine for what that's worth, but she has a fixed uh, both coronal and sagittal plane deformity um, and has a lot of uh, really negative sequelae from that. So the surgical plan, this was after a long discussion with her about what to do and when to do it. She'd been managed non-surgically uh, for... Um, several years other than that hardware removal that had happened uh, at another facility, but she had seen one of our uh, previous surgeons here and then had seen uh, Dr. Hart and they discussed at length what to do. Um, ended up doing a staged operation, uh, revision of the T3 to pelvis with uh, placement of new pelvic screws, revision of any loose hardware uh, of which there really wasn't much. Um, and then asymmetric pedicle subtraction osteotomy is at L2 and L4 in order to realign her both coronally and sagittally. And then um, to provide inner body support, we thought about doing a T lift above that, uh, but felt that a, a procedure like an O lift would be better to get a larger cage in, or I should say a, a ATP O lift, whichever you prefer, whatever term you prefer, uh, a lateral approach anterior to the psoas. Um, and so post-op stage one, uh, you'd already see a significant correction there with that two-level PSO down at the bottom. Uh, lumbar lordosis is still a little off from the pelvic incidence, uh, but sufficient to get her standing upright. Um, an SBA of now plus 1.5 centimeters, so much improved from where it was before. Um, her pelvic tilt also significantly improved, so she's no longer retroverting as much to try to get herself into that posture. And coronally, again, it's not perfect, um, but significantly better from baseline. She's very happy with that. 
she actually went home uh, post-op day seven after that first stage that surgery went really well. We had like 600 cc's of blood loss or something like that for a pretty large operation. We were pretty pleased with that. Um, then we brought her back uh, after about six weeks uh, and did the OLIF and you can see the, um, oops, I didn't mean to advance. Oh, you can't see, oh, you can see my pointer. You can see the OLIF cage there that we did uh, just above that L2 PSO just for anterior column support. Um, and this is something that Dr. Hart has been doing with some of his cases, particularly uh, long segment fusions where he'll do osteotomies and sort of uh, realign somebody and then do the anterior column support later, feeling that he gets a much larger graft in um, from the front slash side uh, rather than doing a traditional um, T-lift at that time. And th there are certainly pros and cons to doing that, but it worked out very well uh, for this patient at least. So. So this is a interesting, it's obviously an extremely challenging case and you did a great mm -hmm. job summarizing it and collapsing it into essentials. Obviously, uh, uh, these kind of decompensated long fusions are a real challenge and should be avoided wherever possible. Yeah. And having a good anterior column support and realignment and following good biomechanical principles, including understanding the dynamics of rod fixation is important. Yeah. Um, but as I look at this again, I'm not sure why um, the staging is done. But again, we've had these discussions before. Um, yeah. uh, it makes sense to obviously fill in a large gap. We've shown several cases this morning. Um, uh, one question I have for Dr. Villamil. Dr. Villamil, you've joined us from what I gather. Good morning. Can you unmute your microphone? Dr. Billamil, hi. Let's just start with Dr. Oskuyan and we'll have you um, open up your microphone when possible. So this is obviously kind of an interesting uh, twist. So oblique uh, inner body fusions versus far laterals. I know you're one of the mm -hmm. three main uh, propagators of the far lateral approach. Why would you uh, go far lateral and not obliquely anteriorly? Or why would you go obliquely in reverse and not far lateral? I mean, I think answer the psoas is um, a reasonable approach. I think uh, going lateral, I think the main issue is the plexus. So I think this is two, three. Yeah, one, two. I mean, yeah, it one, really two. doesn't so matter. It really doesn't do matter. Level. And yeah, I know. It's irrelevant. Yeah, I think that at this level, it doesn't really matter whether you go oblique or, or lateral. Exactly. I think it's actually probably easier to go um, lateral because now you've got the diaphragm and it's a little bit more of a, you have to make a larger opening because yeah, of the vessels we had and the we ribs. The rib out, so. And so I think going lateral would probably be easier at this level, but dealer's choice. Um, and I think the concern always with PSOs is getting it to heal because um, you, you know, it has like a 30% pseudoarthrosis rate. The only other thing I can see, and um, again, I, I think maybe going in from the back and doing a unilateral, maybe IDO on one side to try to push them over, push her over, because you can see she's still a little bit coronally off. That's the only other thing I going probably would have later, later done. Down. I don't know, what do you think, Jens? I think coronal rebalancing is one of the single biggest challenges in mm -hmm. these post-fusion cases, because you really have to kind of do an eccentric um, yeah. osteotomy and you have to really load your rods maximally. This is where, again, these supplemental rods came in and they have all sorts of crazy names and several of our fellows are writing great new papers about uh, how to call those and what to use them for. So with these kickstand rods or mm -hmm. um, supplemental rods can really be helpful in that, but it is and remains very, very hard. Mm -hmm. What this patient tells me is while the alignment was clearly improved, uh, she still holds her head off. So she has... right never rebalanced her internal GPS. The not cranial yet. GPS has not reset. Not and so she is going to, just like our patient before, the developmentally disabled young man, uh, she's still going to want to fall to the side. This is something very, very difficult to overcome. It takes a lot of training. And again, yeah. in patients on a lot of opiates, this kind of a self-resurrection can be very hard. Yeah. Dr. Villamil, are you live now? Uh, yep, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Villamil. Yes, can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. Are you Good morning. in Oklahoma or are you in Puerto Rico? I'm in Jinx, Oklahoma right now. 
Great. Very good to have you. So we showed a couple of cases, and I don't know whether you will talk about that in your lecture, but this patient had, from one of our partners, Olif's done to supplement a complex series of PSOs uh, to rebalance a failed spine. Uh, far lateral exposures versus obliques and doing them after major deformity surgery. Any thoughts on that? Yep. So uh, um, I, I trained uh, the good old uh, purple way, so direct lateral. So I am a big believer on the end-to-end -end end plate coverage. So uh, if I can go direct lateral, I will. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about my, my technique that I use. Uh, but if I can go lateral, I, I will go lateral as much as I can. Great. Okay. But the correction was beautiful in this case. This was a, a very beautiful case. Yeah. I mean, the patient was improved. Our partner, Dr. Hart, who can't be here right now, did a nice job, but we discussed that quite a bit. And he's given some lectures now on this philosophy of doing major deformity corrections from the backside first, not exactly minimally invasive, um, but uh, very uh, powerful. And then filling in the gaps from the front secondarily. And several of the cases that we showed this morning follow that same philosophy. Like we had a burst fracture, we had a salvage procedure, we had a corrective osteotomy. We used anterior supplemental less invasive procedures to fill in the holes in the fronts, if you so will. So, um, Without much further ado, why don't we start with you? It's a great honor to have you. We've not worked with you before, but um, uh, Dr. Fernando Villamil is an orthopedic spine surgeon. He's in Jenks, Oklahoma, which is south of Tulsa, if I'm correct. And we love the state of Oklahoma. Actually, Dr. Nathan Pratt is an Oklahoman originally. And uh, Dr. Villamil was an orthopedic spine surgeon um, who trained at Mass General and at the Harvard Combined Spine Program with our good friends Kirk Wood in those days and Chris Bono. And he is uh, working part-time, I guess, in Puerto Rico and in Jenks. And um, he obviously has a strong interest in less invasive surgeries, uh, as we all do. Um, and we thought we'd have him talk about his philosophy of lateral surgeries. Uh, and obviously, you have in the audience here Dr. Oskuyan, who's one of the originators, together with Dr. Pimento and uh, Juan Uribe, of uh, far lateral surgery. So he just came from a course in Miami. So you have a critical audience here. Uh, but we're very curious to hear your thoughts on how to approach this and what the merits and what the pitfalls are. Without much further ado, good morning, Dr. Villamil, and uh, show us what you got. Yeah, good morning, good morning, and thank you for the introduction. So uh, I named this talk uh, Advanced Lateral Lumbar Surgery Approaches, and what I'm proposing uh, for, uh, to you guys, it's a new neurovascular approach classification system. So you, you notice that I threw the word advanced right there because we have been doing lateral now for, I guess, somewhere around 20 years uh, since it was uh, introduced to us. Uh, I think it's time for us to now talk like we are talk about uh, advancements in lateral surgery and not just lateral surgery uh, itself. Um, I did my training in, in, in medical school and in orthopedic training in Puerto Rico. I did my fellowship, like you mentioned, uh, at Mass General and the, and the uh, uh, Harvard hospitals, very conservative uh, places back then. So I did my trainings, you know, the pool, you know, front and backs, the big wax, the shark bike incisions, I guess. Uh, so my practice, right now basically resembles nothing to what I trained. I pretty much retrained myself. I always had a, an interest in small incisions. Uh, uh, so right now my practice is pretty much 100% MIS uh, and about half of that is lateral. Uh, I practice in, in Jinx, Oklahoma. I still go to Puerto Rico a week per month or so. Uh, so I still take care of patients there. Uh, I am in Oklahoma right now, weather getting better. Um, so I've been doing lateral surgery for, I would say somewhere around 13 years. Um, develop, it's not a right word. Uh, probably I, I promoted a modified direct lateral approach. Uh, we call it A2P, but not, a, uh, not as in anterior to uh, the psoas, but more like anterior to posterior. Um, you, you guys can see my screen there, right? Yes. Okay, uh, so I've utilized this uh, uh, A2P approach very successfully in my patients for the last uh, nine years. Uh, and, and this was born from my very personal concerns and also by talking to other surgeons about the concern about the direct lateral approach as it was uh, first you know, started uh, docking that posterior third of the, uh, uh, of the disc space. Uh, but this be be became the driver behind all these uh, new modifications to the procedure that we have been doing now, uh, I think the oblique approach is a very brilliant way of capturing surgeons and bringing them into the lateral space because of course we are moving away from all the concerns 
uh, of the femoral nerve and, 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 and the, the plexus uh, and the psoas uh, and thigh symptoms in general. Uh, so the reason I, I promote this uh, anterior to posterior, again, A2P as in anterior to posterior, not anterior to the psoas, is because uh, uh, I target the anterior third and not the posterior third. So the goal is to target the safe or at least the safest zone. Um, so there's less chance of aborting the procedure because of the potential uh, quote unquote blind uh, neuromonitoring readings. So what I, uh, what I've been, what I was seeing is that even with, you know, experience, I, I, it was always the surprise element. I was, uh, I was never sure of what was gonna happen with the neuromonitoring. And by starting P to A, uh, the standard, you know, purple way, if you wanna, if we wanna call it that way, uh, uh, I found myself aborting lateral procedures because of uh, just low neuromonitoring readings. Uh, by starting A to P, there's, the, the A to P, there's less uh, disruption to the psoas fibers, which is of course, we know one of the goals of, uh, of the oblique approaches because there's less psoas in the, anterior, in the anterior spinal column, and that's just because of anatomy. Uh, but still, by going A to P direct lateral, we can still think orthogonally. Uh, with good pre planning, there's less risk to the vessels. And what I saw is that I, I, was, I was finding myself working towards the quote-unquote danger zone and not in the actual danger zone by starting P to A. So you see those little circles there on, your, on the right of your screen, uh, you have the direct lateral approach with, uh, you know, with the orthogonal direct disc axis and the, the, the magic of lateral, which in my opinion is going end to end on that apophysial ring, which we know it's the strongest part of the virtual body. And then you, you, you have the oblique approaches, which are the psoas sparing and the nerve uh, sparing approaches. And where, they, where, where they, those two little circles kind of mix, then we have anterior to posterior direct lateral, uh, which is what I'm promoting. So uh, what to use, uh, of course, it's, uh, you know, surgeon's choice and, and the approach, the better approach is the one that the surgeon is better and most proficient, of course, we know that. Uh, what I've been seeing uh, in the last 13 years is that lateral can be unpredictable. Uh, you'd be surprised on how many times uh, I'm 100% sure that I'm not gonna use angled instruments because my, my crest is not gonna get, get, in, get in the way. And here I am, you know, 20 minutes later, asking my rep to bring the, uh, the uh, angle sets because I, I do have a high press. Uh, also the nerves, uh, as much as you can look at the psoas, uh, you have a nice thick round psoas, and then you start getting these low neuromonitoring readings. So there is a surprise element with lateral, which I think is driving uh, a lot of surgeons uh, away from lateral at four or five, uh, which is, of course, we know it's one of the most common um, um, segments. Uh, we, of course, know there's not a one size fits all. Um, um, uh, each approach is a, it basically a, a tool in, the, in our backs. And, and of course, we know they all have their pros and cons. Uh, we can go a uh direct lateral, which is the, the, the posterior to anterior uh, traditional way. We have the, uh, uh, the anterior to posterior, which is the one that I'm promoting. We have the newer, uh, newer oblique approach. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, we have all the posterior approaches, uh, PLIF and TLIF. Um, but what I what 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 I'm uh, what you're going to see here is that I think we have to uh, uh, come with a way of better communicating and, and start speaking lateral uh, amongst us surgeons here, and then also between surgeons and their OR staff, and, and even between surgeons and 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 reps. Uh, so we need to speak to start speaking a lateral language. We know there's uh, the lateral, the lateral anatomy has been, you know, very studied for, for many years. There's studies, uh, I went back to 2010 and 2011, but I'm sure there's probably stuff even before that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out now uh, in 2020, 2021 about the, uh, you know, the working corridors and, and, and psoas anatomy and, and vessel anatomy and, their, and, and nerve plexus anatomy. So we know there's, there's, there's anatomy study that's being well studied out there, but I don't think we fully applied it in a way that we can all start to speak the same, the same language. Um, Dr. Uribe and Dr. Morrow back in 2003 and 2010, they, they did this beautiful, uh, uh, Uribe did this beautiful cadaveric study that he showed us on, on the anatomy. Uh, Morrow in 2003, if you see that image there in the middle, uh, if, you, if you think of it, uh, it doesn't really make too much, much, much sense to start posterior to anterior, which is how we all learn lateral, because we're actually there in, in, in the middle of the jungle. We're right there where the, where the most of the uh, danger zones are located. 
Um, so what I'm proposing to you guys is a, a preoperative neurovascular approach classification that can help us uh, um, make our surgeries more predictable and then more reproducible so that we, we can bring more uh, surgeons, uh, uh, the, the older ones in practice and the new ones coming out, uh, and they can, we can bring them to lateral because I have had so much success with lateral surgery. I think it should be, should, there should be more patients out there benefiting from this. So uh, it starts with, uh, with uh, um, adequate preoperative evaluation of the imaging studies. Uh, of course, we've seen that 200 million times. Uh, MRI, we know it's the gold standard, but a CT scan or a CT myogram can be used for those patients that cannot have, a, cannot have an MRI. And this is basically, basically the, the, this is it. This is the slide that I wanted to show you. So I'm sorry I had to bore you with all the previous slides here, but this is my, my, what I'm proposing, my neurovascular approach classification for actual lumbar anatomy. Uh, basically, I try to make, make it very simple. So it's a type one, type two, and type three based on, uh, on vascular uh, anatomy. Uh, so a type one would be where vessels, you can see there on this image right here. So those vessels we occupy from zero to 10% of the virtual body going from anterior to posterior. A type two, those vessels, the aorta and the, uh, and the vena cava or the iliacs, they will move and occupy up to 25% of the virtual body come, going from anterior to posterior. And then type three is right here, which those vessels will occupy up to 50% of the virtual body. And for those, and for those uh, three types, I added an A modifier, which accounts to, uh, for basically what we now call the Mickey Mouse ears uh, or the elongated psoas. Uh, we know that uh, uh, when we see Mickey Mouse ears, that goes hand in hand, um, uh, or typically with a uh, um, uh, high crest and, and, and angle instruments for that matter. So, so the reason I'm, I'm, I'm proposing this classification, uh, you can see on this little table back there, down here, is to try to decide and, and predict with better accuracy uh, which approach we're going to use. So if you have a type one, that's basically you know a, a green light. You can go you can go direct lateral. You can go posterior to anterior, the classic purple way. You can go anterior to posterior, which is the one that I'm proposing uh, or promoting, I should say. Uh, you can go uh, oblique. And there's it's going to be safe there. You can go uh, a lift if you're willing you know to move those vessels to the side. And of course, the, the, the posterior approach is always there. Um, type two, then, then it becomes a little more tricky because those vessels are gonna be occupying 25% of the virtual body. So of course, you, can, you wanna come uh, alif if you want. If you're gonna come oblique, then uh, maybe you wanna think, think twice because you're gonna have uh, stuff happening here. You, so maybe you wanna have your vascular surgeon uh, somewhere close just in case. And of course, you can do direct lateral, posterior to anterior, it's gonna be safe. Uh, a to P, which is what I'm you know, promoting. Uh, you can do them, but then you have to be a little extra careful, careful just in case. Type threes, if you decide to do a lateral on a type three, perhaps you should stay home and, 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 and skip work that day because it's gonna be very, very dangerous. If you have the A modifier, then you have the Mickey Mouse ears. So same thing, same, same, same uh, uh, potential approaches apply. So a type one, you can do pretty much whatever you want, green light, but you know you're gonna have uh, nerves that are, that are going to be somewhere here. So you have to be prepared for uh, potentially lower neuromonitoring readings. Uh, you also can be uh, 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 better prepared uh, with your angle sets because you can, you, there's a probability that you may encounter like a high crest. If you have a type 2A, this is probably what I consider one of the most challenging approaches because uh, for a lateral, because you have your vessels here, you can have your nurse here. So your working corridor is basically going to go from here to here. So uh, um, basically, uh, you can do a lateral, but you have to make sure that your, your rep has the 18 size uh, wide um, implants and not your 22s, for example. And then, of course, your angle instruments. Uh, type 3A, uh, you can go anterior, you can go oblique, uh, but definitely you want to go direct lateral. And of course, the posterior approaches are always there. So these more for, for anterior column uh, surgery. So, so the reason I bring these, uh, uh, or I propose this classification is because now we can start to, to speak lateral. So I can tell uh, Dr. O, hey, I have this uh, patient that I want to refer to, he's a type one, uh, and he's gonna say, hey, sure, you know, send him over, that's gonna be a free throw uh, shot. Uh, but if I tell him, hey, I have this type two A, uh, he's gonna say, huh, maybe, maybe, or yeah, send him over, but I'm gonna call my vascular surgeon. Uh, even talking to reps. So if my rep knows that I have type 2A, he knows he has to bring, he has to bring to the OR 
not only the lateral sets, but also the chile sets, because you know there's a, a, a potential for that case to be uh, converted into a chile instead of a, a lateral. Um, so I have a couple examples here. So that's pretty much the, the, the classification, type one, two, and three, and then the A modifier. Um, so these are examples of those images. So a type one, you see it's, uh, you know, vessels are way uh, in the front. You have these nice round soas. So we pretty much have access to uh, uh, pretty much any approach you can perform in these ones right here. Type one A, your vessels are way out here, way out here, where you start to get the sneaky mouse ears. So you know those nerves are gonna get started getting your way. So you have to be prepared for lower nerve monitoring readings, perhaps size 18 cages and not 22 cages. Uh, uh, and your rep has to be aware of that. Uh, type two, again, so these vessels, they go back to uh, 20, um, um, to 25% of the uh, uh, vertebral body right here, where your psoas are nice and round. Uh, this is probably more, more like a type one. Uh, type 2A, these are the most challenging ones because you have your vessels here and you have the Mickey Mouse ears. So you know your working corridor is going to be somewhere right from here to here. So again, same, same, same as here. So this is probably a transitional segment for this image right here. We have your vessels right here, Mickey Mouse ears. So you know you can be in trouble because you're going to get lower neuromonitoring readings here. Same, 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 same thing happens here. Type three uh, A's are, are those rare. That's a transitional segment that I found uh, in one of my patients. Uh, uh, you have your vessels right there occupying 50% of the vertebral body, Mickey Mouse ears. Type three alone, I couldn't, could not find an image because those are, I guess, are a little more rare. So these are some example cases that I did. I completely obvi obviated the uh, clinical aspects because here it's more about the, uh, uh, the images uh, and anatomy and not the actual clinical case. But this is actually, believe it or not, it's a 5-1. So it is a 5-1, which we're not supposed to be doing five, uh, laterals on 5-1, but if you look at these images right here, uh, we're a little tilted on this image right here, but it is, it is actually a type one according to the classification that I'm proposing because the vessels are way up here in the front, occupying less than 10%. And then you have this nice round psoas right here. So, so just by looking at the pre-up images, I, I, I told my, my guys in my OR, hey, this is a 5-1, they look at me with a weird face, uh, but I told them, hey, this is going to be a type one, five one. Uh, so those are the uh, x-rays right here. And then for this patient, we ended up doing uh, a direct anterior to posterior approach. You can see where my shim actually ducks anterior and not posterior. Uh, of course, angle instruments because it, it is a five one. So I ended up doing a, a lateral, full lateral, even with the plate and, and, and two screws here. And you see the, the uh, you know, the magic of lateral, which is that end plate to end plate end plate to end plate uh, um, 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 occupation, I guess, of the, of the cage and, and, and just the amount of, of, of vertebral or interspace height restoration is just, 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 just um, uh, unbeatable in my opinion from a lateral. So that was a 5-1 um, um, direct lateral, which we, were, which we were able to predict that we were able to get, a, to get away with just by looking at the anatomy and being able to being able to classify it as a type one. Uh, here, this became a, a, a three-level case. So again, classification. So we have, a, this is a type one A. So this is five one right here. You see the vessels are way out here. So that makes it a type one. Uh, this is a, a, you know, Mickey Mouse ears here. So it became a type one A because of the uh, neural anatomy. So uh, let me see, this is four, five right here. Yep, this is four, five right here. So this is basically a type two. So vessels are way out, big round so has no Mickey Mouse ears. And then three, four, which basically it'll never be, a, 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 um, uh, we're never gonna have basically any, any um, a vascular or nerve problems from three, four and up. So this case became um, a three level lateral surgery. So, so this is my, my favorite construct, so I go, unilateral because I think just by the size of these lateral cages, they're going by going end, end to end of the end plates right here. They just work great. So I uh, do single position lateral surgeries. I will do uh, screws and a rod on one side. I will put a plate typically in this case, like in the middle for added uh, support. Uh, you're probably asking why did I use pick, uh, pick here on 5.1? And that's just because my rep did not have the, uh, the, uh, the 18 titanium cages there. Uh, on the OR, so I ended up doing a, a, a peak cage here. Uh, I have seen tremendous, tremendous height restoration with uh, 3D printed titanium. So I'm a big believer in 3D printed titanium now. The amount, the amount of uh, 
of, uh, uh, of this height restoration that you can get not only anterior, but even posterior. These are actually 10 degree angled cages and you can see how much space we got here. Uh, and then 5.1, same thing. You have all this all these much space rest restoration. So we went from, from basically from here, very little space right there to here, all this much space right here. Uh, this is another type one adjacent segment generation. This patient had done an A-lift on her uh, uh, back when I was doing, you know, the, the open cases uh, 14 years ago. Uh, healed very nicely. She came back with three, four, and four, five uh, adjacent segment degeneration. But you can see here at four, five, uh, it is a, a, a type one, so the vessels are way out. Uh, nice round cells in the Mickey Mouse ears. So I was able to get a direct lateral anterior to posterior. So I thought again when I. When I talk about anterior to posterior, I'm not talking about oblique or anterior to the psoas, but I'm talking about direct lateral. So I will uh, dock my uh, I will dock my shim right here instead of right here, which is how we, we were taught, I guess, when we started doing these surgeries. Hey, Dr. Uh, Mills. so yes. we have a couple of questions. Sorry to interrupt there. Absolutely, so, yes. No, no, absolutely, yes. Good morning, Dr. Gupta. Good morning, Dr. Parekh. Uh, we've had a whole bunch of uh, great colleagues from around the world, Dr. Uh, Medisa Madera is also on again. Uh, one question that came out is, are you doing these same day uh, like an outpatient surgery center or are these uh, staged in terms of several uh, separate OR settings? So, so not, not staged. I do the lateral and then I put the screws because I do single position. So I fire the screws uh, on the same, the same day. Uh, uh, they stay in the hospital. Um, as much as we are trying to make surgeries Outpatient, in, in my and this is my very personal opinion, I think it's a little brutal to send a patient on the same day. Um, so, pa so patients do stay uh, one or sometimes they want to stay a couple nights. So uh, I don't have problems with keeping up, uh, patients a couple nights in the hospital, but at least a day they, they, they do stay, yes. And Dr. Correa asked something that I was going to bring up. Uh, so these unilateral fixations, we actually did a meta-analysis and uh, there's a couple of really good reviews on that unilateral lumbar fixation has been a subject of some controversy for a while. And uh, from what I understand from the meta-analyses, uh, they're probably okay for one level instrumentations and in degenerative conditions with a relatively collapsed disc. Now you obviously change the uh, equation by putting anterior instrumentation in, but I saw some multi-levels in there. So uh, I, I have to, as a referee kind of say, um, and as an editor in chief of uh, co editor in chief of Global Spine Journal, as far as I know, there's no literature evidence to support multi level lumbar unilateral fixation. Obviously, again, to repeat that, you've done anterior column support and there's some fixation there. Do you have any um, kind of literature support or a, a, a case series to kind of show that uh, multi level unilateral fixation actually works? So, uh, um... Basically, my, my, my own personal experience, uh, when I first started doing unilateral for more than one or two levels, um, um, I basically sat down with Dr. Bill Smith one point, uh, once and I asked him, hey, how many levels do you go lateral? And he told me, hey, I go up to five. And I was like, hey, if this, this, this guy is doing five, I'm sure I can, I can get away with those as well. Uh, I, I, do, I am aware of the studies that show that a, that a size 26 cage Standalone is as strong as an 18 cage and four screws. So, uh, um, uh, because these cages we're using now are so big, and then because I go end to end on the end plates uh, with a direct lateral approach, um, and with the new 3D printed titanium now, uh, I, I rarely see subsidence, to be very honest, and, and patients do very well, and I can still do the surgery as a single stage uh, uh, and, and pretty fast. We're always you know, preaching about how to be, how you have to be fast, you know, in and out with lateral surgery to avoid the extended distraction times. Uh, a two level surgery, we get it done now in, in probably like an hour. Uh, three level is gonna be like an hour and a half. So that's the reason. Uh, uh, no, no data that I'm aware of on multi-level lateral. Uh, I know there are studies uh, with unilateral fixation from, from years ago, uh, not, not with lateral surgery and, and they, were, uh, uh, they were doing good back then. So, so I guess the answer is uh, no, no data right now. Yeah, so I, I'd ask that you obviously collect these very carefully and follow them up over a two-year period and contribute to the literature because just for the audience, I just want to make sure SSF does not endorse multi-level 
uh, lumbar fixation of my unilateral approach, uh, but uh, it's certainly interesting. Again, as you had said uh, and shown, uh, you're changing the paradigm by using different anti inner body uh, devices, but that was uh, pertinent to Dr. Coria's uh, alert um, inquisition. So, um, Fernando, one comment. Um, this is Rod. Uh, I appreciate the um, <clears throat> effort into kind of classifying and looking at vascular structures. I think it's um, important to, uh, you know, understand the anatomy. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, again, in my experience, <clears throat> I think you'd focus on four or five. Um, but to me, four or five, the, the most you know, critical structure is the lumbar plexus. Um, and, you know, again, I, I haven't really, you know, um, had a lot of vascular issues at four or five. Um, I think if you're going to come anterior to the psoas, then it's a different, you know, ball game. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's always good. And I think since you know, people are doing more ATP and kind of looking at different ways to avoid the plexus. I think it's good to look at the MRIs and the CT scans and locate the vascular structures. You definitely can get um, an iliac vein and artery that kind of is more lateral than what you expect. But I think that to me, the, you know, the, the beauty of doing lateral is that, um, you know, it's a small incision and uh, you can put a big graft in and, and um, uh, get good indirect decompression, but it's still, you know, I, st I still get really anxious at four or five because of the plexus. Does your classification, do you, um, is the plexus play a role in the classification or is it just the vascular structures? Yep, no, no, a hundred percent. So uh, uh, of course we know the, the nurse, and even neuro, neuro monitoring, you know, is a, is a mystery science. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, so we have this case right here in front of you. So this case is in my classification, it's what I would call a type 2A. So the A modifier uh, um, uh, accounts for the Mickey Mouse ears. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you can see here, this is a, a 5-1, more like a transitional segment. Uh, some some radiologists might, might even call this a uh, um, you know, a four five uh, or a five one. So, but you can see here on the, on the actual, on the MRI, you have your vessels right here. They're occupying up to 25% of the, of the space right here. So, you know, there, you have to be careful there. You have to be careful coming from an oblique approach here because that's what you're going to hit right there. So you better have your vascular access surgeon, you know, ready or on, on standby. Uh, you can certainly come anterior if you want. If you're going to come direct lateral here, then you have your big humongous Mickey Mouse ears here. You can have your, you can see your nerve root coming out from here. So in this case, your, your um, uh, working corridor would be somewhere from here to here, which I think is very, very, very tight and very dangerous. So in this case, in my hands, I, uh, as much as I love lateral surgery, to me, this became uh, a tea leaf uh, procedure, which you can see here on your far right. Uh, I'm not a super, super fan of uh, um, A-lifts on, on older patients. This patient was an older patient. So uh, um, I decided to go and go full posterior. So she ended up being a, ended up being a T-lift, which I was able to plan preoperatively. So that's, that's, I think that's the most important, I guess, uh, um, 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 thing that I'm trying to, to promote here is the fact that we can actually be more predictive on, on what's going to happen during the surgery. Can I, can I actually do this as a, as a lateral, uh, uh, do I have the experience to go full lateral, even though the vessels are going to be there, or have some 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 Mickey Mouse in their ears? Uh, um, um, should I, you know, have my uh, vascular surgeon ready? Should I have my rep bring the tea leaf set and have it in the in, inside the OR just in case? So I think by by just paying more attention and then classifying. Let me see if I can get you my 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 back quickly because I just need a case just now before coming here. Um, so this is what, patient, what a patient will bring to my, uh, to my OR if the, if the, uh, um, if the, uh, um, the uh, MRI is not available on the computer system. So, so they will bring this little disc. So I write my name to remind them that they have to bring it from surgery. So here it says it's gonna be an L45 XLIF and it says type one and it says left side up. So, so when I first got to the hospital this morning before coming here, 
I said, yes, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be on time for my presentation because this is going to be a free throw line shot, which, you know, knock on wood, it ended up being because it was a type one, uh, no A modifier, so no nerves. So I knew it was going to be a quick in and out case. Um, in this case, um, um, next case, it is a type one A, but because of the Mickey Mouse ears, I decided to go for a right-sided approach instead of a left-sided approach. We do have Mickey Mouse ears here. Bezels occupy less than 1% of the vertebral body right here. But if, but I saw this and I was like, ah, this, all this whiteness right here, when I see this white stuff here, I get a little uh, more concerned about what, what's gonna happen with the neuromonitoring readings. So you compare this side on the left side versus this side, I figured, huh, I think the right side is gonna be a little uh, easier or less challenging, and it was. It ended up being uh, uh, much less challenging. So this became um, a two-level case coming from the right side instead of the left side. So that's another uh, 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 added value to the classification. You can actually tell your staff, hey, make sure you can be, you can have a flip room and you can tell you know, the guys next door, hey, make sure the patient goes you know, right side up because I pre-planned for this procedure and I can tell them, hey, this is a right side type one or right side type two or left side 2A. Uh, and I can communicate better with my uh, uh, industry reps, with my OR staff, with my PA. Uh, and and the, the value that I see in this is that we have a lot of patients that cannot get an MRI, but guess what? We can use a, a CAT scan as well because we have uh, beautiful, you know, views of our vessels right there, even on bone windows or, or soft tissue windows on actual cuts on CAT scans as well. Uh, the other good use that I can find, which I already mentioned, is that it's very useful for transitional segments. So even though this is a uh, 5-1 slash, slash 4-5, depending on how you want to call it, or ra your radiologist, but you can see here that this is very clearly a type 1 because your vessels are way up here and there's no Mickey Mouse ears. So, you know, this is going to be a standard uh, direct lateral approach. Uh, again, I do like lateral, direct lateral, because of, of, of the magic of lateral, which I think is what started the whole, you know, lateral revolution, which is going uh, from here to here in those end plates. My, my opinion, uh, and of course, I know oblique is a great approach, uh, safer to an extent, uh, but to me, when you come in this direction right here and you have to use your little twist and turn maneuver right here, in my opinion, you lose the magic of going end to end on that end plate. So that's the reason why I have never made the full jump to oblique approaches, because I, in my opinion, I think we lose that. So by going anterior to posterior, I can safely dock here. Uh, these vessels, you know, are not gonna get in the way. Actually, when you dock your shin here, you know, you actually have added extra protection against your, your vessels. Um, but that's just how I do the lateral surgery is A2P. Uh, this is more about the, the classification that I'm trying to propose because I think we have to just start talking lateral uh, among, amongst us here. And I think this is a great idea. We have to come to a close now, unfortunately, but uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Any last question, uh, Jens? Yeah, fire, fire ahead. This is Dr. Tarek Sohail from Lahore, Pakistan. Thank you. Interesting, uh, Dr. Willem, very interesting uh, presentation uh, and the thought about uh, the, um, you know, the geographical location of the uh, vessels in relation to Mickey Mouse and et cetera. Tell me what are the limitations of this classification and how it's going to guide us. Second is, is the state of uh, arterial sclerosis or something of similar sort has any implication on your uh, classification or approach uh, in this area? Um, you mean if the if the vessels are calcified? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not not at all. Uh, it's actually even easier because I can even see it on X-rays. So when you have those 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 uh, aortas or those iliacs that you can almost see the entire uh, vessel, you, you you can be even more safe that your vessels are out of the way. But they make no difference whatsoever in terms of which approach to uh, uh, to use coming anterior to posterior. I guess in theory, if you're coming from an oblique approach or an alif and you have to move those vessels, then you have to be a little extra careful because you know you're gonna encounter calcified vessels. When you're type three, you, uh, the, the, when the aorta is fairly buried down under the uh, psoas, then uh, if it's a calcified, if you try to mobilize, you might uh, hurt it or you might throw an ambulance from there. Correct, I agree. Great. Thank you, yes.
Well, thank you, Tariq. Uh, so, Fernando, final summary. Uh, so, I think um, you've opened up our eyes towards a morphologic approach and a cross section morphologic approach uh, sophistication that is really worthwhile. I'm not sure how to put that into an article yet, but I think it's certainly an important consideration together with uh, access angles like uh, pelvic height, uh, iliac crest, uh, morphology, et cetera. Um, so thank you for coming on today. Um, uh, we hope to engage with you in the future. And again, I hope you understand my, my worrisome statement about the multi-level unilateral rod fixation. I'm looking forward to having your clinical series to show how that's safe and effective, but um, uh, that was great. Any final comments from your end? Fernando, any um, final? Um, no, I think I think I think I hope you you liked it, and I hope we can start talking lateral from from Good. from from this All point right. on. Now we thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you all for joining us.